1873, Stevenson was ordered south for health reasons on the recommendation of Dr. Andrew Clark and on the advice of his London friends, Sidney Colvin and Francis Sitwell. The doctor said that the young man had no serious physical problem, but insisted that he traveled alone and especially far away from his family. So RLS chose to recover his health in a place that had kept a very warm corner in his heart ever since he was there with his parents 10 years before. I'm currently <coughs> studying Stevenson's time in Mentone through his letters in trying to trace all the people he met and all the places he, he visited there, matters relatively overlooked by his biographers. So I've taken advantage to the, of this conference to search for traces of pleasure in the Mentone letters and discover the different passages in which they can be revealed. Oh, by the way, I'm using the, the Italian spelling of the town's name, the one used by RLS himself, the county of Nice uh, having been annexed to France just 13 years before, in the more euphonious Italian manner, <laughs> as Sidney Colvin said. <laughs> His stay in Mentone has been viewed as three distinct periods, at the Hotel du Pavillon on the West Bay, in Monte Carlo with Sidney Colvin, and at the Hotel Mirabeau on the East Bay. Through all this time, we witness his education sentimental, the emotional development of a young man, and also the dawn of a great author an impatient evolution that was to change completely his approach to life, society, and his own feelings too. From this point of view, we can also perceive some remarkable differences between RLS as the essayist of Ordered South and the real RLS of the letters. As the conference suggests, the word pressure can obviously mean many things, uh, as many as the different occasions in which RLS expresses himself precisely about pleasure, enjoyment, or delight. He arrived in Mentone, excited but exhausted, on the 12th of November 1873, which was the day before his 23rd birthday, and initially sojourned at the Hotel du Pavillon on the West Bay, just across the road from the Princess Villa. There, during his first weeks alone, he tried writing, but couldn't sustain the effort, so most of, most of the time he found consolation in reading George Sand's novels, sitting on a bench outside the garden wall, or under some canes on the beach. He didn't know anyone at the hotel. Most of the people there were British, keeping a respectable distance. In any case, our RLS always preferred to speak French, and in addition, during this first, the first <coughs> days, was often too exhausted to spend much time socializing. Biographers usually insist on the fact that during the whole of this first period in Mentone, because of his frailty, he remained shy, lonely, and secluded. On the contrary, his letters show that he made a considerable effort, making more than 40 acquaintances just during the first month. He had been ordered south while very, very weak. He felt <coughs> stressed, depressed, sometimes ill, and often insensitive even to his favorite landscapes. Common neurotic symptoms, I think, not real diseases, which he himself will describe as a nervous breakdown in a very clear illuminated way while recovering a month later. Yet, even in this first pitiable state, as he calls it, feeling down and with occasional pain all over his body, he could find unexpected moments of pure bliss. Randomly and suddenly, he could experience some pleasure and emotional delight, mainly in landscapes. He began to embrace these happy moments as inevitable and didn't refuse to be happy, even if only for a minute before and after which he might be crying or aching or feeling alone in front of the fireplace. He was living moment by moment in complete idleness, just keeping going. Though he was depressed and ill or felt tired or sad, some moments seemed to him like a window opening on a stunning landscape, and he accepted 
all this and fully live that particular pleasant moment. So at Orange, on the way to his final destination, he described this first enthusiasm on rising and throwing open the shutters. I quote, such a great living flood of sunshine poured in upon me that I confess to having danced and expressed my satisfaction aloud. And on his arrival at Mentone, he experienced the sort of illumination of the senses that suddenly overwhelmed him. I quote again, today has been one long delight coming to a magnificent climax on my arrival here. I was somewhat confused as yet as to my directions. Suddenly, as I was going forward slowly in this confusion of mind, I was met by a great valley of others out of the lemon and orange gardens, and the past linked on to the present. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the whole scene fell before me into order, and I was at home. I nearly danced again. He simply accepted such a moment when it came. It was unavoidable, so strong that he couldn't avoid being happy for the duration of that moment. He couldn't escape it, and he didn't want to. In fact, he embraced this, this fleeting moment. It was inevitable, and he'd experienced it fully, even if it was short-lived. As he notes three weeks later, no one would refuse to look at a sunset because a sunset cannot last. On the 15th of December, RLS met Colvin in Monaco, where they spent days of total idleness in the battlemented gardens of the old town and on the low terrace at Monte Carlo, the sea shining in front of them. But uh, as Ellie Bacon observed in a recent video announcing her next novel, both gentlemen were also writing love letters to the same unhappily married woman, Mrs. Frances Seatwell. She, as we know, was in a lifelong loving relationship with Calvin, but was also Stevenson's first infatuation for an older woman, his Consuelo. Ellie Bacon asks herself if it was, and I quote, a full-blown physical love affair or just a crush of a young man on an older woman. We hope she will find an answer to this through a study. <laughs> Uh, the young Louis expressed to Sitwell his sense of pleasure enjoyed without family constraints in the open heaven and fields. By just having some happy time, one will become stronger and happier, as pleasure can only strengthen and renew. And he ended with a picture of a metaphorical impressionist landscape. I've looked over my shoulder and see a tall ship standing out seaward in a silver haze, the sails just tipped with sun. Nature and love together will also contribute to a princely festival of pleasure provoked by the first violet of the season given to him by the young child of a friend. It's a perfect description of a melting pot of delightful feelings that connect all senses, love, heart, mind and nature as fully offered to Francis Citrus. The scent of that small flower gives an irrepressible intoxicating secret trouble to the heart, and the heart itself becomes a bunch of violets. Beauty brings back beauty from the past. He feels transfigured and transported out of himself. But if he seeks to repeat that experience, it's gone, like a wind blowing to one out of the fairyland. In a description involving all the senses, the violet sings like a March blackbird, giving an adorable tremor through the soul, and the heart is pierced by a sword of delicate penetrating sensation. And finally, the brain is swept and garnished as an empty house full of perfume and love. Through the second part of this letter, we learn that all these intense feelings had been unexpectedly amplified by an opium pill, at that time, as we know, commonly used to cure any sort of pain. As he told Sitwell, the drug worked for the first time in giving him an extraordinary happiness and the most inexpressible bliss all day long 
while almost terrifying pleasures crowded upon him in bed at night, accompanied by wonderful tremors and a delirious but enjoyable swimming head. Back to Monte Carlo on the 2nd of January, Arles and Colvin found the Hotel du Pavillon had no vacancies, so they moved to the newly opened Hotel Mirabeau on the Eastern Bay. This hotel doesn't exist anymore. Colvin's company had stimulated Arles to resume writing. Besides, his health had begun to improve and the company at the hotel contributed to his recovery. The Mirabeau was the only hotel with a restaurant hosting ex external guests too, and during this time Arles made acquaintance with about 43 pe people. He met many fascinating people, most of whom could be the subject of other interesting studies. Trying to stay on topic, I'll mention here the two intriguing Russian princesses, Madame Nadia Zaseski and her sister, Madame Sofia Gashin. The two ladies often had lunch at the hotel while they were living at the Villa Marina close by. That villa seems to have survived. They often invited our lesson and other guests to parties at the villa. We know how one or both women tried to have a playfully flirtatious relationship with a timid RLS who felt at first embarrassed but nevertheless behaved diplomatically and avoided any compromising situation, always being in love at a distance with his own idol, Fanny Sitro. Not until almost at the end of his stay did he understand that the flirtation was carried out uh, three parts at least in jest and one part in earnest by Madame Zaseski, who acted as a playful instigator to her more discreet sister, Madame Madame Gachin. Madame Gachin then promised to write to him from a spa in France's bud where they could meet again. But uh, regrettably, this never happened, among other things, because RLS lost her address. <laughs> <laughs> Through the letters, we are shown a charming, multifaceted portrait of the two women, who were 38 and 35 years old, respectively. We learn that they had come to the French Riviera from Georgia to improve their health, and both had a husband in Russia. Madame Zaseski was tall, very beautiful, dark, appalling looking, in short a character for a tragedy, and according to Colvin, with all the unblushing outspokenness of her race, its unchecked vehemence and immutability in mirth and anger, in scorn, attachment or aversion. Her personality, as Arles himself confirmed, was to inspire the character of Countess of Roses, Rosen in Prince Otto. Arles seemed to prefer Nadia's sister, Sofia, a fine person, a most sympathetic, reserved about herself, a very second sighty person, and an atheist. She said she'd never loved any man, but would have been a morose of Christ. Obviously, she didn't intend to go back to her sick husband. Arles ascribed their odd behaviors to some Russian lack of inhibitions about social norms and religious restrictions, as seen through European eyes. These manners would have touched this feeling with an impatient and senseless way. Nadia Zaseski was at Mentone with her youngest child, Nelly, or Nelichka, two and a half years old. Arles spent much of his time with the child, who, with other children at the hotel, would inspire some of his future writings. Little Nelly was a hell of a jolly kid, knew six languages, danced, sang, played, played hide and seek, and washed their dolls with Arles, and made fun of his long hair. He wrote that the children at the hotel were the delight of his life, I quote. Last night, I saw them all dancing. Oh, it was jolly. Kids are what's the matter with me. Obviously, children were inspiring the scientifically absorbed essays of notes on the movement of young children and of child's play. But what the real men are or less felt being with them and their families is clearly expressed only in his letters 
as an immensity of delight that children gave him through an anticipation of their future life of beauty. For him, children are certainly too good to be true. After losing at a game to a girl, little girl at the hotel, he sent her a little verse, I quote, telling how happy children make, made everyone near them happy also, and advising her to keep the lines, and someday when she was grown a stately demoiselle, it would make her glad to know she gave pleasure long ago. Uh, Robert Louis Abrahamson suggested to me that Mentone recognized or less with the delight he had experienced as a child. This delight ha had been destroyed in his adolescence when, she, when he rebelled against the respectable Edinburgh. Also, the children in Mentone helped him to return to his literary vocation, refreshed and eager to write. At the Villa Marina, the party had delightful and passionate musical evenings based on a collection of Scottish melodies which Madame Zaseski played on the piano with excitement, comparing Scottish and Russian airs. Arles remembered a particular night in which he had the great pleasure and was really proud to be a Scotsman. In a manuscript at Yale titled The Night in France, he describes in poetic prose and in almost impressionist brushstrokes that particular night and the perfect southern landscape surrounding the Villa Marina. And here again, he senses the contrast between the whole night scene and the nostalgic piano music coming from the villa, which reminds him of faraway countries, Scottish lads away from home, and the love up in the north that is like the red, red rose. From the letters, we also learn about the arrival of a so-called cousin of the two sisters, Prince Leo Galicin. And now I'd like to share with you how much pleasure may come from biographic research and discovery. We can retrace Galicin's biography from many Russian records concerning his intriguing personality, later becoming the creator of Russian high quality champagne. Let's gossip, or should I say biographically learn. Uh, Lev Sergeyevich Golitsyn was then only 27 years old and wasn't a cousin at all. He had met Princess Nadia Zaseski several years before when she was already married. They had two daughters, Sofia, born in 1871, and not yet born at the time, Nadia, in 1876. Now, we can identify this Sofia Zaseski, Golitsyn's natural daughter, as Stevenson's adored Nelly, according to her confirmed birth date, 1871. Also, while browsing online, I discovered that Sofia, that is Stevenson's Nelly, would call her eldest daughter Marina, like the Villa Mentone, and her eldest son Leo, like the, her natural father. And after browsing many more Russian websites, I couldn't believe it. I finally found Nelly. By comparing the two pictures, I think we can identify Sophia, that is Stevenson's Nelly, with the little girl on the left. And in this picture, the young lady on the left is indeed the very same Sophia Nelly, sitting with her father Leo and her stepmother. Finally, I got this picture from one of Sophia's descendants, uh, saying that it could be a portrait of Madame Nadia Zaseski and her little Sophia. But it's most, more, most likely a wrong interpretation because of clothes and their dressing, more suitable to the 1920s or 1930s. One last thought. Even though there are no pictures of Stevenson in Mentone, he does tell us that he and his Russian friends all got their photographs taken, and among those, one of him pretty fair and one of Nelly quite adorable. So let's hope one of these days we'll, we'll find those pictures too. Thank you. <laughs>